All right, welcome to the great players of the past. Uh, this lecture is on your favorite player, Igor Bondarevsky. And it's funny, on, on Facebook, um, where I posted the stuff, El Shamor Diabati, your favorite grandmaster, wrote Igor, double X clam. And then the, somebody commented on the thing. There's no picture on, on Wikipedia. Uh, was, yeah, there's a picture here. There's one there. Yeah, that's the picture. And then uh, he said, it looks like Steve Carell. So there you go. Yeah. And then Archer answered with, who's Steve Carell, right? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, there's a Steve Carell, uh, uh, what's the word? Connection to the chess center, which I'm sure you all know. Sure. Well, you do know, you just don't know you know it. When you guys were playing Blitz just now, there's a picture of me on the wall, and the picture says, what's the caption? No, nothing, no. The 40-year-old Grandmaster. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Confusing Archer even further. Yeah, it'll all become clear later. Okay, so Bondarevsky didn't get a lot of publicity for the layperson because he was one of the top players in the Soviet Union, but not the top. So you heard of like Smyslov and Botvinnik and Tall, they're all like, who? And so you never heard of like the next year because it's so many good Soviet players. Um, the person that I think of when I think of Bondarevsky, obviously, is Boleslavsky. No, nothing, no, no. Yeah, Boleslavsky is probably even more famous. I don't want to do him, he's too famous. And Bondarevsky was like probably number 10 in the Soviet Union, which would be like number one in two in every other country, but Soviet Union's tough. Okay, so uh, he died pretty young, 1979, at the age of 66. He was a grandmaster, international correspondence grandmaster, and international arbiter. And you're just sitting there like tying your shoe. See, that guy's pretty good, right? And he played in a lot of tournaments, and he got sick near the end of his life. Possibly he's more famous lately, when I say lately, I mean 50 years ago instead of 100 years ago, as being Spassky's coach. And he was coached him all the way to the World Championship when he beat Petrosian in the World Championship. In the 72 World Championship, he did not coach him. Although I don't know why, falling out, maybe he died. And he died in 79, so he could have coached him. Okay, and um, there's a lot of stuff about Bondarevsky, obviously. There's the chessgames.com showing games he played Smyslov and Botvinnik and lots of other strong grandmasters. There's an article that was written by some doofus, and I don't know what the point of the article is. He just basically quotes like Wikipedia. Then he shows a game that Smyslov beat him. It's a very strange article, but there's a picture of him, and you guys know who that is. Right there, yeah? It's, it's this guy. Yeah, Smyslov, yeah. Smyslov, as you all know, was at, uh, in attendance at my first wedding. Also, I've played Smyslov twice. I have a win and a draw. That'll teach him to be old. Also, it'll teach him to play me in a simul. That's also what I taught him. In a simul, I won, although he was winning. And then in the real game was a draw. Okay, it was pretty short. Then I found a picture of Bondarevsky from a game we're going to look at. And then there's another picture of Bondarevsky, and you know who that is? Spassky. Yeah, and he coached Spassky and so forth. Yeah, that's when he was older. Because of the picture, he wasn't as old. Yeah. Okay, let's get to the important stuff, the, his games. So probably my favorite game was this game that actually you, was the, the picture of. Yeah. Bondarevsky was black against your favorite player, Alexander Kotov. Yeah, and he wrote what book? Man, this class is tough. Think like a grandmaster. Very famous book. Also play like a grandmaster. And he lost a very famous game. When I say he lost, I mean he won. He won a very famous game against Yuri Averbach, obviously. In what tournament? No, nothing. Zurich 1953, the candidates tournament. Yeah. That's where he sacked his queen and Averbach's king walked all over the board. That was a good game. Okay. So Kotov was a pretty strong player. This was played in Leningrad in 1936, which is now known as... No? If you don't know, you could say 2018. Because it's 2018 now. Okay? Yeah. But the correct answer, obviously, is St. Petersburg. Obviously. I thought they'd know that. Yeah. 
Okay, what do they know? They know that the Latin word for empty slate is tabula rasa. That's what they know, right? Now you do. Okay. Anyway, this is Kota Bondarevsky. A lot of the great games played between 1910 and 1950 were Stonewall Dutches because people didn't know how to defend, so they got crushed. And for class players like yourselves, you should be doing that. It's positionally suspect, but your opponents can't refute it, then you win. So that's what happened in this game. So it was a Stonewall Dutch named after your favorite general. Stonewall Jackson. There you go. He finally got one of my jokes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now for extra credit. Which Simpsons character played Stonewall Jackson? It's the, probably the least likely one you'd suspect. No? Nobody? The answer is Apu. He played Stonewall Jackson. And then Apu always says, thank you, come again, with his store. He said the cell shall rise again. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So... Now we're going to start the lecture over because we have somebody who just showed up, I think. Okay. Hi, I'm Ben Feingold. Yeah. All right. So C4, C6. And this is sort of the starting position for the Stonewall Dutch. Now, the Stonewall Dutch looks good because we play knight e4 and we push these pawns and we put our queen over here and we win. So that's good. The reason it's bad is this bishop's a little iffy. It's got a lot of pawns in front of it. And if this bishop's iffy, that means this rook is iffy, because how's the rook going to get out? But who needs a bishop and a rook when you mate your opponent? Now, players today are slightly more sophisticated. And when I say players, I mean like the top in the world. And so usually they're not playing openings that are positionally suspect, hoping for mate, because then they get really bad positions. But this was 1936, and... Positional play wasn't at its, you know, epoch, and, uh, I mean, the people didn't, you know, have 20 moves of theory to refute everything. Still, I think it's a playable opening. Now, your favorite player in Georgia, possibly the second highest rated woman in Georgia. Yeah, I think she's second. Her name's Thanu Avernini, or Nenny. Oh. You know Thanu. She plays the Stonewall Dutch when she's black. Okay, and then she goes, rawr. Okay, and then I'm like, quiet, it's a tournament. Okay, so knight bd2, that's not very common nowadays. We don't like to put the knight on d2 if we don't have to. Some people would play bishop f4 and get rid of this bishop and keep black with that bishop. But okay, knight bd2 is okay. Okay, queen e8 with the obvious idea of? Uh, queen g6. Keep going. Queen h5. Queen h5. Also possible is the long maneuver to h5 with the bishop so the bishop is good instead of bad. And most people today would probably fianchetto their bishop or play bishop a6. But okay, queen e8, queen h5, white resigns. That's the idea. Okay, knight e1, which the engine does not like. And normally when we play knight e1, we want to play knight d3 and sometimes try to trade off the dark squared bishops, which is hard to do with the knight on d2. And the other idea of knight e1, which isn't what's happening here, is if black plays a very early knight e4, sometimes white plays knight e1, then kicks it out with f3. Although since there's no knight on e4, you can't really kick him out. Okay, knight d7, knight d3, knight e4. Now we can kick him out, although that's pretty weakening. You could sack on g3, you could play knight c3. Okay, knight f3. And this is a common maneuver for white's knights. White controls e5. White can play bishop f4. Makes sense. Queen h5. Knight f4 attacking the queen. That's probably not what I would do. Because I would want to trade these bishops. So if I was going to put a knight on f4, I'd probably play bishop f4. And then if they took it, then I could kick out the queen with knight f4. Okay, and black just played queen f7. And now... The knight did kick the queen out, but the knight's not well placed on f4 because black will play g5, which is what happened. So queen c2, which does nothing, rawr, g5, and then queen h5. And then they agreed to a draw because they repeated knight f4, queen f7. No, they didn't do that. Okay, the knight went to e5. Now let's see who's paying attention. I'm betting on nobody. Okay, they're all asleep actually. Is this the king knight or the queen knight? 
One person is pretty sure the other two are like they, they pass. Queen knight. Queen knight? And you agree? Yeah, three for three. Yeah, see, this knight did that, and then this knight did this. Also, that knight went here, just in case. Yeah. So White was obviously a fan of Bob Seeger before he was born. Right? Right, Archer? Because he's working on his knight moves. Yeah. Okay. I made that joke on the internet today, but I forgot why. Oh, yeah. I saw puzzles on the internet where it's White to play and win, and it's like several under promotions to a knight. And the reason is you unstalemate the opponent. If you promote to a queen, it's stalemate. So you make a knight, and then you keep sacking the knight and promoting to a knight and just to avoid stalemate. And then you mate him with the knight. Yeah. Okay, so I saw a lot of that today. Okay, rook f6 with obvious intentions. What are these intentions? H6. Yeah, rook h6. So black's like, I don't need these pieces to beat you. I'm Bondarevsky. Feingold's lecturing on me. I don't need that. Okay. Now we can make fun of black's queenside pieces, but whites are sort of the same. So it's sort of fair what, what he's doing. Okay, f3 kicking out the knight, and the knight has a lot of retreat squares. Now, normally when I'm giving chess lessons, these are the kind of blunders my students make. They're like, oh, my knight can't go anywhere. Oh, well, I lose a knight. Obviously, Bondarevsky had bigger fish to fry because he wasn't a vegan, like me. Okay, rook h6, rawr. And basically, this is how Bondarevsky played. He played super aggressive, and that doesn't necessarily work against Botvinnik, but yeah, Ko taught me to work against him. Okay, h4. Otherwise, you get sort of in trouble on the king side. You get in trouble with h4 also. Yeah. Knight takes g3, takes on g5, queen check, king f2 obviously, rook h4. And I've never seen this maneuver before. Black played rook h4 and took the d4 pawn. Never in all my years, and I have a lot of years. Okay, we can't play rook h1 because the knight's defending that. Otherwise, I play rook h1. Rook g1 takes on d4, which I find funny. Bishop b2, queen h4, rawr! Now we have double, discovered, triple, quadruple check, which is what happened. And the truth hurts. Oh. And you play king e3, rawr! Okay, man, I'd be afraid to play king e3. Now, what happens on king f1? I'm an old man. Hmm. I could take on e5. Let's see. King f1. Do I have, like, maiden 1? I don't see it. I could take on e5. I'm guessing that king f1 is a better move. So if, if the computer announces mate, I'll look quite the fool. King f1 is a better move. Yes. Okay. So it's funny. After king f1, the computer suggests repeating and then taking this and saying black has a big advantage. So that was good that he played knight e4 check because a computer... See, this is, again, we've talked about this in classes before, but you guys were asleep and you guys weren't here and none of you were listening. If the computer believes after knight e4... King f1, the best move is knight g3. Then And then here the best move is queen takes bishop. Oh. If it believes that... What, what? No? If it believes that, then in this position it's going to play queen takes bishop. A human would never do that. I mean a good human. A good human would go here and hope for king e3. Which the computer says king e3, that's ridiculous, I'm not hoping for that. And then after king f1, the human just plays knight g3 and takes the bishop. So we give the guy a chance. And the chance worked. King e3. Good chance. Okay. And now, black sacked everything for mate, which is good. Okay. So f4 check. Then white played the obvious move. Knight Yeah. Queen f2. Then white played the obvious move. King e3. Uh, king d3. King d3. Queen takes bishop check, just what you were expecting. Now, let's see if you guys in the audience are paying attention. Hopefully you're screaming at home, I hope. Not at the chess game, you're just screaming because you're crazy. What game does this remind you of? What famous game from the past? The correct answer, obviously, is Pologayevsky and Nezhmedinov. Yeah, they're all nodding. No, okay. That game, 
Black sacrificed his queen, Nezhmedinov, and White's king ran up the board to the queen's side. Here, White's king didn't make it so far because Paul Gavsky was pretty good. Okay, king takes is the only legal move. Bishop c5 check, one legal move. And it made, and the truth hurts. Probably somebody told you at some point in your life, don't walk your king up the board. That's correct. Yeah. And so earlier in the lecture, I said black doesn't use these pieces, and he agreed. He didn't need those. Yeah. So white's defense wasn't very good. That's why black won. But black put a lot of pressure on white. White had to find excellent defensive moves and did not. And you would think a guy who sacrifices his rook and sacrifices his queen and makes a famous player in 27 moves with black that you would have heard of him. See, Russia had a lot of good players. So, yeah. And um, Kotsov is clearly more famous than Bondarevsky in the West. In Russia, I don't know. But Western masters, international masters, grandmasters all heard of Kotsov because Kotsov wrote books, played in more tournaments than Bondarevsky, was more famous. But as you can see, maybe he wasn't a better player. Maybe. Yeah, the truth hurts. Okay, so that was a nice attack. Now, Panov is also a famous player, not necessarily for his chess, but for his chess, but there's an opening named after him. So that, that helps. He's like, yeah. Okay, and that opening is in the Karo Khan. If you take on d5 and play c4, that's called the Panov Botvinnik attack. So Panov, go Panov. Okay. And this was um, a tournament sponsored by Apple, because you can see the X here. Oh, wait, that's not related. Yeah. Okay, now again, this is old school chess. This is 1937, the year my dad was born. And in old school chess, when the players were strong, you had round robins, very common, which they have now. However, unlike now, those round robins were long. Okay, this is round 14. I don't know how many rounds it was, but it could have been you know, 20 or 30. Nowadays, I mean, 14, no. Like, even Vikonze is 13 rounds, and that's really long. So that's, I mean, usually they're 9 rounds or 11 rounds. Yeah. This is round 14 of who knows. You know, could have been 20 players. Okay, so those tournaments were tough because you play for a month, and everybody you play is a grandmaster, so it's harsh. Okay, Bondarevsky's black, and he played the French, so Archer's happy. Okay. And let's see, I think I lost my prop for this game. I can't find my Tarash can. Yeah. This is the Tarash variation named after which grandmaster? It's not variation. I don't know his first name, but it's Tarash. First name was Siegbert, Dr. Siegbert Tarash. Did I do a lecture on him in this class? Maybe. 50 50. Okay. He was a German player. And uh, yeah, I'm tired of Nazi jokes. We'll just continue. Okay. Nowadays, there's three moves. When I say three, I mean four. I just don't count very well. Knight f6, knight c6, takes, and c5. In the 1970s, when I was learning chess, the main practitioner of the French was, I accept two answers. No? Victor Korchnoi. I would have also accepted Wolfgang Ullmann, but you never heard of him, so you're probably not gonna say that. He was the best or second best German player and he always played the French, always. Okay, and in those days, Korshner was playing c5 every game. Nowadays, knight f6 is probably more common. And knight c6 was named after your favorite grandmaster, that means they've never heard of him, Carlos Guillemard. Okay, and I played knight c6 when I used to play the French. Okay, he played c5, and there was a very unusual move in this game, because this is all like the mainline theory even though it's 1937. Now, black always plays bishop to d6 here, and then plays knight to e7, and then castles. And if I turn on the, the reference database, maybe I'm right. And when I say maybe I'm right, I better be right. Okay, when it says no games found, it's lying. So we'll let it sit for a second. I, it wants me to have some coffee, so it's... You know. Okay, so bishop d6, see I was right. Okay, that's almost every game, right? 3,000 games, then there's a few other games. And you can see black is, well, Karpov's black? That's very strange. Ivanchuk, Hare Krishna, Karpov, etc. Okay. So you're a big fan of Hare Krishna? 
Yeah. You heard of him? B Hare Krishna? Yeah. yeah. You, what's the P for? Uh, Bendelia. Yeah, close enough. Yeah. Okay, and what's his favorite food? That I don't know. Okra. Come on, man, wake up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but Hare Krishna beat one of my ex wives at a simul. Which one? I don't know. Okay. So, uh, yeah, he's a very nice guy, actually. Unlike the other Indian great. No, they're all nice. Okay. So, um, we'll go back here. Now, I know Bishop D6. I used to play the French, and I've had this position. This move, I don't know. This is the move like a beginner would play, except we're lecturing on Bondarevsky. He's probably not a beginner. What's a good beginner move here for black? Beginners will play it every time. Every time. Queen e7. There you go, spoken like a beginner. Well, I, would have, I would have accepted a6. I read the notation. Yeah, and I would have accepted a6. Oh, okay. yeah. oh I had the notation on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, queen e7 because it's check. Yeah, that move I don't know. Okay, well, I mean, king f1 is weird. I mean, knight e5 is probably playable, then I could take on d4. So he played bishop e2, that was his point. Now the queen's stupid on e7, so he immediately moved, he played queen c7. That doesn't seem like it worked out so bad. Like he could have played queen c7, then white's bishops on b5 pinning the knight. So this seems like that was okay. Nobody plays it, but it was 1937, so nobody play anything. So maybe white should have played queen e2 and traded queens? Nobody knows. You know who does know? Not just stockfish, but stockfish. What would the Germans say? Nine. Nine, which came out this week. That's why I have it. I read the form. Yeah, stockfish nine. No, I play it. See, it's arguing with itself. It's too good. It's like bishop e2, no queen e2. Okay, so it likes bishop e2. Panov was pretty good. Okay, so bishop e2, queen c7. Now it looks like a normal, everything's normal. They just threw in, you know, bishop e2 and queen e7. This looks normal. Now, if I was white, it's very unlikely I would take on c5 when black's bishop is on f8. And the normal main lines where black plays bishop d6 and then plays bishop takes, he's losing a tempo. So this is, it's hooked up black pretty nicely. Play bishop takes in one move. Man, that's pretty good. Look at those active pieces. All the pieces are out. This guy says, wow, those pieces are active. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and he, I don't know how he knows, yeah. Okay, probably we're bugged or something. Okay, knight b3, obviously. Now, there's a big discussion in the chess world amongst grandmasters for the last million years or so, whether to keep the bishop on this diagonal or this diagonal. This was 1937, they didn't have those discussions then. So he went here. That's the more aggressive option, but you're sort of worried at some point, white may go here and trade the bishops, then you're left with that guy. That guy's, that guy's not as good. Okay, come on, cut me some slack, because they're talking to me on slack. That's why it was funny. Okay, so knight d4, castles. And normally, you want to take a bishop for a knight, but probably not here, because that bishop's not very good. This is an isolated pawn, and now you're, you're really helping this rook out. So, and then we have two center pawns. So I don't think black was worried about that. Okay, so he played c3. Okay, defending his knight some more. Knight to e5, that's pretty aggressive. h3. Now, after bishop f4, which was not played, but looks sort of obvious, then black has the amazing tactic. It's not very amazing. Sort of a boring tactic. Knight of three check? Yeah, that's sort of boring. But then you get to take the bishop. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so he played h3. Now, in my professional opinion, and I'm professional, when you play c3, then h3, I'm not a big fan of that. Maybe white should move his piece. Nah, crazy, crazy talk. What am I talking about? Now again, you never heard of Bondarevsky, but he's beating everybody with the black pieces in the Soviet championship. Maybe you should have heard of him. Probably pretty good. Okay, knight c4, and that knight just sits on c4 forever, or so I thought. Bishop d3, rook e8. I probably would move the other rook, but he's ready for knight takes e6, and then his rook is pretty good. So, okay. Knight e2. Now, again, as a professional, when they go c3, h3, knight here, knight here, I'm not really scared. In fact, I don't understand knight e2. Maybe he wants to play bishop f4, knight f4, I don't know. But, I mean, he blocked this bishop, and then he unblocked it. So, I don't know, it's strange. Okay, bishop takes h3. Rawr! Recommended by Shirov. Anybody? No? Nothing? No? 
that famous end game position, right? With bishop h3. Yeah, yeah exactly. So that was, was bishop, that wasn't even taking anything. Okay, so obviously the idea, which Archer has done many times, is this is pinned. So we want to play queen g3 check, right? Yeah. So after takes, I assume he would play either rook takes knight with the idea of queen g3 check, or he would play bishop takes f2, and if king takes f2, rawr. And he probably calculated that, that was good for him. Or he didn't calculate it, but it looked good. Like, yeah, I'm crushing him. Okay. And then white's doing like the, the knight's tour, and he's moving all of his pawns. So black's like, I'm going to crush you. Okay. So white played a move you've never heard of. A Zwischenzug. Bishop to f4. Now there's no queen g3 check. And black's like, whatever. That was the first time that had ever been said in that kind of fashion. 1937. Whatever. So he played queen d7, and he's down a piece, but he has a big attack. Okay, he's got his queen up in the guy's grill, his bishop's over here, his rook's here, his knight's coming in here. Maybe this knight's going to do something. Maybe knight takes b2 is a good move. What do I know? Right? You see what I'm talking about. So it's sort of scary with black, with white. White's scared. Okay, he took the knight, which the, the gawking rebel on the internet didn't like that move. They were like, oh, that's a terrible move. Now... Black is, this is, that's a serious, that's serious, that wins. This queen on h3 is attacking the bishop also. Usually when the guy's checkmating you, if you trade pieces, they won't checkmate you. So that seems like a logical move, but people on the internet didn't like that move. Okay. Queen g4 check, another mission zook. King f1, bishop takes f2. He's sort of ignoring that bishop. Yeah, Bondarevsky, he was mean. I mean, he wanted to checkmate you. King takes f2, knight e4 check. Bondra Did you ever notice Archer, Bondreski plays like you? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, you like to do all that stuff. You play all those moves he made. Yeah. yeah, you like to sack and check. Yeah, he plays like you. Yeah. Man, the truth hurts. Okay, king, king f1. Now let's see who's paying attention. How many pieces is black down? Two pieces. And see, somebody's not paying attention. Three pieces. So. Yeah. yeah, shocking, right? It is a lot. Three, yeah. Okay. Queen f3 check. And now, what would Morphe do? Rookie six. Yeah, and I, the correct answer is age inappropriate. If you see the movie South Park. Queen f2 and rookie six. Could play rookie six right away. Yeah. Okay, so the reason I said what would Morphe do is Morphe used all of his pieces to attack, not just his queen and knight. So it seems like if this rook goes to g6, that would be annoying because queen here and queen here, so forth. Okay, so bishop takes d5, queen f3 check, rook g6, threatening queen g2 and queen h5. I like them both. And these pieces aren't defending too much. They're not like helping the king at all. Bishop f7. And he gets some, gets some spite checks in. There you go. Look at, that. Look at all the checks he got. That's pretty good. If it was like a one minute game, he went a one on time. Check, check, and then he didn't get mated. Knight yeah. g3, stopping all those checkmates I told you about. Stop queen g2 mate and queen h5 mate. He really stopped queen h5. He stopped it twice. Queen f2. And now, white did something you've never heard of. Resigned. He resigned. So after king here, I don't know what the right move is, but I like this. Okay. And if you don't like that, we can do it in reverse. Right? Probably also good. Well, then you can play knight h5. Then I would have to win the game again. I assume I'm winning anyway. But. And if you play king, king h3, I think black's better here. Everybody agrees? Yeah, it's mate next move. Yeah. So after queen f2, he resigned. So, man, Bondarevsky with two scintillating attacks with the black pieces against people who were more famous than him. I don't think either one of those guys was better than him, but his name was sort of close to Boleslavsky, and Boleslavsky was more famous. You never heard of him either. So, yeah. Okay, so that was the two games that I thought were quite good. Now, this game was probably more interesting than the first two. I wasn't impressed, but I really liked the last move. You guys won't like the last move. It's a move I like. You guys like other stuff. Okay. And this is against Makinas, who also I've heard of. And one thing I like about this game is uh, 
I used to play this way with black, and I would play it to mix it up. Based on the way Bondarevsky would play, I wouldn't mix it up. I'd play really boring. So I think McKinnis made a mistake here mixing it up. So he played the most enterprising move you can play here. Very enterprising. Very enterprising. Slightly suspicious. Knight c6. More suspicious than that. H6. Well, that's, that's <laughs> silly. Now, this is a book move, but you don't play it. Also, you might play it after this lecture. My last guess is c5. c5 is also... Actually, c5 usually leads to a boring position, where white's better. This does not lead to a boring position. It was named after your favorite grandmaster. He wasn't a grandmaster. Albin. Oh, well, e5 then. E5, the Albin counter gambit, confusing the class. Oh, yeah. I used to play the Albin counter gambit all the time. That's why I don't play anymore. No. Okay. And the idea is, after takes, you play d4. Although, <clears throat> in the olden days, some people would take on c4. Now, the reason the Albin counter gambit is cool is it's home to the most famous opening trap ever with the coolest trap. Now, of course, that trap is silly. However, I did play it once when I was seven. My opponent was not happy. He wasn't happy before the game either, but this made him more unhappy. You with some crazy comment. The Lasker trap with e3? Yeah, except white should play queen a4 check, which also loses. So e3 is a mistake that a lot of low-rated players make, which didn't happen this game. And the idea is that, well, here queen a4 check is the right move, but this is, this is the, the, the best trap. Now, if you take, I win your queen, so that's good for black. And after king e2, when I show this to kids, they, they solve it by, by brute force saying out loud what they think. And then I go, no, 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 then correct. Because it's a process of elimination. As Homer Simpson would say, the two sweetest words in the English language, default. Okay? So they say bishop g4 check. Then when I go here, they go, oh. Okay? <laughs> then they promote to a queen... And then if you take the queen, then bishop g4 check. But I don't take the queen, I take their queen. Oh. And then they go, oh. And then they go, wait a minute, now I got it. Well, they actually still don't got it. You! Take the knight from to a knight. Uh, wait, what's happening? Yeah. Yeah, and then you make a knight, and it's check because I said so. Mm -hmm. And now, like most positions in chess, black has three knights. And now, if you've never seen this before, which obviously you haven't, based on your look on your face, now white plays king e1. Because if you take the knight, bishop g4 check wins. And now this knight's trapped. <clears throat> so white can get his material back, except he can't, because the queen h4 check. And g3 loses the rook. So you play king f2, and then queen f2 check defends this precious knight. And I've actually had this position, but it was over 40 years ago, and I won. Okay, and the computer will give a very large number, confusing the audience. Very, the audience is very confused. That's not as large as I thought. Only plus 3.6? Come on. Terrible computer. Stockfish 9, it's already out of date. It's like a week old. Yeah, horrible. Okay, well, it's on two CPUs. You can see why, you know, it's no good. Okay. Anyway, obviously, that's winning for black. Okay, so after D4, Grandmaster's play. Knight F3. Knight F3. Okay. And then some GMs play G3 here, and some play A3. You! I was going to suggest A3. That's a move. Okay, he played G3. <laughs> Bishop G4, that's the old move. When I was playing the Alban Counter Gambit, mainly in the 80s and early 90s, I was playing Bishop E6, which pretends to attack this pawn. Okay? Then if they defend it, I get a tempo. Okay. Bishop G4 is the old move. And... White's play isn't very scintillating this game, but it's very interesting. Okay. And, wow, he allowed bishop to d3. He didn't care at all. And he allowed this. And he's like, whatever, I don't care if I'm going to mate you. So normally, both sides have a mating attack, and White tries to avoid losing material. But this is Bondarevsky. Bondarevsky says, you can win material as long as I mate you and you don't mate me. So now Black doesn't really have any attack. Usually black's playing bishop h3 and h5, h4, and then going rawr. But here, white has the attack against black's king, and black's just not material. However, black sacrificed material to start. So it's setting me up the exchange in a pawn, just an exchange. However, these pieces are very suspicious. 
and this looks good this looks good this looks good and white's king is super safe if i turn the engine on Ooh, I don't know what the engine is going to say. Usually I have a good idea. I don't have any idea. I mean, if I was an engine, I'd like black. So that's, I'm guessing it likes black. I don't know. I mean, I'm an engine. And it likes white. Man, that's not good when it likes white. When you're down in exchange and it likes white, that's, ooh, that's not good. That means you're getting crushed. So black spent a lot of time winning the E2 pawn in the rook instead of spending a lot of time playing for me. He played rook e8, bishop d3, bishop, and he didn't play for me, and now the tables have turned. Okay, king b8, following my rule, always play king b8. I always say king b1, but it's black. What do you want me to do? Obviously, white wants to play b5 and queen a7. b5, now queen a7 is less good. The audience agrees. Knight takes d4, now... Black, white has a pawn for the exchange, plus he's got a lot of attacking going on, okay? As J Jerry Lee Lewis would say, there's a whole lot of attacking going on. Yeah, nobody got that, and you didn't get it at home either. If you're, if you're Jerry Lee Lewis and you're watching this, then you got it. Okay, so bishop c5, the obvious move. Knight to b3, and white has all his pieces doing something. They're all, they're all attacking and defending and in the right sector and so on. And the rook in the corner is horrible. Bishop takes, bishop takes. Man, I'd hate to be black in this position. So I'm guessing it's about plus five. That's just a random guess. Okay, it is random guess. Man, I can't believe Stockfish 9 isn't as good as me. We think it would be as good. Yeah, it'll be plus five in about 20 minutes. Yeah, it goes up and it's like, yeah. Okay, but anyway, the computer says that white's winning. White's threatening checkmate here. Queen a7, queen a8. B6, ooh, b6. C5, rook e7, defending the second ranks. Yeah, the rook defend, that's good. Yeah. Okay, now, archer in less than a second would play. I guess it was more than a second. You, your archer. <laughs> Bishop takes b6. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta sack everything. Yeah, <laughs> archer style. Now, if it was white's move here, knight c5 looks pretty good. So, okay, he took. Rawr. Check. Check. Takes. Queen c7. Knight d4, knight f5, also known as knife f5. Now, if the rook moves, I take your knight on d7. So he played the maneuver. Rook check and rook d1. Yeah. And so I wasn't going to show this game because I thought it was too one-sided. Although... I mean, White sacrificed a lot of material, and then he sort of won later. So I like that. That's, that was good understanding, because I thought the computer would like black, but I was wrong. The reason I showed this game in the end, probably should have shown it anyway, is I really like this move. Okay, and you're not going to like it. You're going to be really mad when you see what he played. This is the Ben Feingold kind of move. I really like this move. And when I saw this move and Black resigned, I was like, oh man, I never get to make moves like this. This is my dream. Now you guys would sack your queen and say you, you'd find some pieces to sack. Okay, I don't that's not moves I like. I like moves like this because nobody ever thinks of them, and yet it was played. So that's that's pretty impressive to me. So let's see if you guys find I don't even know if it's the best move. I didn't engine it. But I was like, wow, that move's great. And it was the best move because Black resigned. So I'd say it worked out better than any other movie could have played. So I really like this move a lot. You Bishop c6. That's just boring. Yeah. <laughs> Bishop c6, I have no doubt, wins immediately. No doubt. But that's, that, that doesn't excite me at all. Yeah. I guess king e6, defending my knight. Yeah, bishop c6 might be better than the right move, but I doubt it. Yeah, if you played bishop c6, I wouldn't have shown this game. Ah, this game was boring. <laughs> I said white just crushed black this game. This game was boring. Yeah. But I, I really like this move a lot. 
I want to give you a hint, but I'm afraid you'll know what the hint is. I think you won't. I don't think you guys know me well enough. If you're at home and you know every detail of my life, this will give the answer away. I used to have a shirt that said this move on it. Yeah, true story. Although actually, did it say the move or did it? No, it did say the move. I thought it might have the number four before, but it didn't. It just had the move with an exclamation mark. And one time I played a guy and he wrote notes for a magazine. And when I played the move, he wrote as advertised by my opponent. I advertised on my shirt when I played, then I played it. I mean, no wonder white won. White played knife f5. This move follows one of my sayings. I have so many sayings, it doesn't help. But it does follow one of my sayings. Always f1. It's always something. What would you say? Always what? Bishop f1. That would be a saying, but I wouldn't play bishop f1 here. Bishop f1 might win pretty quickly. Because no. if he takes, you take on d7. He doesn't take, you play bishop c4 check. So bishop f1 is probably good. Never play F3. Never play F3, so we're not going to do that. Man, F3 is horrible. That's, that's <laughs> it. It's following my rule, never play F3. <laughs> Bishop F1, which looks worse than F3, is better than F3. Because if you take it, Queen D7. <laughs> yeah. Because you can't play Bishop D5 check, you can play Bishop C4 check. Well, C4 is not explosive here. That's correct. There's no F pawn. All, it's always something. <laughs> so. Always. No. You guys have heard it. Well, maybe not you. Always retreat. No, retreat. Well, close. That's a retreat. This is more of a retreat. Queen C2. Queen C2. This is a very funny move because look at that queen on C7. Rawr! Right? Queen C2, never in all of your years have you seen all the D file defended. Never in your life. It's never happened to you. Okay, now those are all defended. These are defended. And these are defended. So that leaves rook e1 and rook a1, right? You agree? Yes. Rook e1, I prefer white. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. If you don't like them, well, okay. Rook a1, and I did this in my head. It could be the computer doesn't agree. After rook a1, then I found these moves. I don't know which is better. I mean, they're the same. I want to go here and I want to go there. I don't want my opponent to do either one of those if I'm black. And the only way to avoid all of that was to do what Black did. Resign. Resign, yeah. Right. And I was like, Queen C2, and I was like, oh man, he can't do anything. Then I tried to refute Rook E1 and Rook A1, and I did pretty quickly. Yeah. Now, it could be Bishop C6 is better. Like, I don't know. But Queen C2, that showed, like, I was like, no, my Rook looks so good. So let's see, and let's see how good Bishop F1 is, because that's funny. Queen C4, Queen C3, Queen C2. What happened to Bishop C6? What happened? Oh man, Queen C2 was number one for a second. Wow. Queen C2. What, the guy's a genius. I knew that was a great move. What happens on Bishop C6? What is, what's the number? And it, it says, no, you can't play that. Wow. Yeah, also winning, but not quite as good. Not quite. Because you stop you stop Queen C2. Okay. Now Bishop F1. Now we're now we're talking. Yeah. Also completely winning. Yeah. The thing is every move's completely winning. But F3, never play F3. Yeah. Also, also good. Yeah. And with, with the idea of Queen C2. Yeah. It's funny, like, who would think of Queen C2? And obviously the engine does, because it's an engine. But, like, he, he's a human and he played it. I was like, wow, Queen C2, the rook can't go anywhere. Because the, the queen looks really good here. Like, you're not moving that. And then and that's exactly what you do. And the, reason, and the thing is, when you attack opponents' pieces, when you guys do it, they move it away and you're like, oh, well. But when grandmasters attack opponent's pieces, there's a higher purpose. Like, wherever it goes, I have a forced win. Or it can't go anywhere, so I win right away. Not just I like attacking pieces. Because bishop f3 also attacks the rook. But then, like, rook d2, that doesn't make any sense. So, but queen c2, man, I can't believe the whole d-file is defended. That's a lot of d-file. Yeah. So as you can see from those three games, Bondarevsky was quite good. And the other games, which they claimed were his best, they were like draws against Vislav and Botvinnik. And I was like, I didn't show you no draws. And they were draws in like 100 moves where Bondarevsky was pressing them, but he couldn't win. He was winning too. But he, you know, Botvinnik and Svislav were pretty good. So Bondarevsky, in my opinion, was clearly top 10 in the world, but got no nothing. Because 
Kerez was better. Smyslov was better. Bavinik was better. Petrosian was better. The Soviet Union was tough. The Soviet Union was so good at chess that when Bavinik was world champion, they wanted to keep him off the Olympic team because he was no good. Then they changed their mind and put him on board one. He won the gold medal. Good decision. But you could see, like, Smyslav was the world champion. Tall was the world champion. Karaz was pretty good. And then they had Geller, who had a plus score against Fisher. So he would be a good player, too. And I'm missing some world champions. Smyslav, Petrosian, Geller, Tall. Is that four? Smyslav, Petrosian, Geller, Tall. Karaz. Man, good team. Tough to be on the Olympic team. You have all world champions on every board, right? So that's why you never heard of Bondarevsky, because he was a world champion. So you never heard of Boleslavsky either, which is, I mean, he has an opening named after him. So, but, but yeah, Bondarevsky didn't get it. And also he died in his, in his mid-60s. So, but, he, but well known in the Soviet Union because he was Spassky's coach. So Bondarevsky. So I always wanted to do a lecture on either Bondarevsky or Boleslavsky, and I finally did one. So I've never been so happy. And as you can see, he liked to mix it up. He liked active play, aggressive, maybe not sound, maybe, maybe a little sound. Reminding you of what world champion? Tall. Yeah, Mikhail Tall. Probably more famous than Bondarevsky. Probably. Yeah. And Tall died even younger, but Tall was after him. I mean, Tall was at his best, you know, in the between like 1960 and 1970, and that's when like Bondarevsky wasn't really playing chess then. He was good in the 40s and 50s. So a, a generation before, but then he could become a coach. In fact, this is funny because in China, once you're like 30, you're a coach. So like the best players in China in the early 20s, 10 years later, they're not listed as the best Chinese players anymore. Okay, you're coaches. So usually, like in this country and other, you know, in your 40s or 50s, you become a coach. But in China, it's like early 30s, that's enough of you. Now we'll get some 20 year olds. Rawr. So this is very common that a lot of the best coaches in the Soviet Union were actually top players in the 30s and 40s, but you never heard of them. And then when they're a coach, they, they do a pretty good job. Yeah. So uh, that, was, that was Bondarevsky, and maybe I'll do a Boleslavsky. Man, that's almost rhymes. No. Okay. And also, uh, some friends of mine were arguing who was better. Bronstein, who you heard of, by the way, that's, talk about Olympic team. Four world champions. Bavinik's the fifth world champion. Bronstein, Geller, Kerez. You got to leave some people off. Good luck. Okay. And, and there's, there's another guy. Who did I just say? Oh, yeah. A Stein and Bronstein. And a lot of people I know think Stein was better. But Bronstein played for the world championship and should have won, but he lost game 23, which he shouldn't have done. And then he tied the match instead of winning the match. If he'd been world champion, he would have got more. He still got a lot of credit. But Stein never played for the world championship, and he died really young. So you're like, Stein, he lost to Fisher. That's all you know about him. Although they didn't know that about him. But, I mean, Stein was really good. So the Soviet Union had so many good players because they enveloped all those countries. Now we have Russia and Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania and Belarus and Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan and 10 more countries, maybe five more. And so now there's all GM teams from all those countries, but in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you had to pick five, six players from all those Soviet Union. So man, it's a tough team. And because of that, great players are basically unknown outside of there because they weren't the top five or six in their country. For example, can you guys name the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh best player in the U.S.? You're like, let's see, Nakamura, Caruana, Wesley, so. And then you're like, you're done. Sure. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. But oh, is Onishuk playing in the top tournaments in the world? No. no. You know who's playing? Nakamura, Caruana, and Wesley, so the people. Komsky used to be top in the country. Now he's not, so he doesn't play in those tournaments. So... When you're number four, five, six, seven in the country, you don't play in the world championship tournaments, so nobody's heard of you. But if you were number five in the Soviet Union, you were like number five in the world. That's, the, the truth hurts. That's why in 1970, they had what tournament? The Soviet Union versus the rest of the world. Who won? Soviet Union. Soviet Union, right. We won on boards one and two, Fisher and Larson, or shall I say Larson and Fisher. Larson was board one, Fisher was board two. They both won their matches, and then I forgot the other eight matches. When I say I forgot, we lost all the other eight. And yeah, the truth hurts. Yeah. 
So they're deep. They have a deep bench. We have like, you know, we got Fisher. Now we have Carlson and they have a deep bench. Uh, now we have, we have Anand and we have Carlson and, and that's it. But I mean, yeah, we go rest of the world. Yeah. Okay, so uh, again, as you all know, we alternate weeks. Next week is the end game lecture. Mm -hmm. And then we do great players of the past. Okay. Again, yeah. All right, now let's all get drunk and play ping pong. I mean, let's play blitz chess. Yeah. Questions? You, incorrect. Okay. Nice. Man, look at that, Bondarevsky. He's old school. Good picture. World champion, guy looks confused. <laughs> That's the game we looked at, remember? I do. Yeah, now, yeah. See, Steve Carell, good player. Should have stuck with vodka. Then they should have given me lost. Yeah. I was in Rostov on, on Don. Most people haven't been there, but I've been there. The reason I was there was very suspicious. I was actually going somewhere else. And I went there and then took a bus somewhere else. Ugh. Ugh. Don't, don't go somewhere else. Yeah, it's not good. Stop. Then what do I do? Save or discard? Tough, tough decision. Okay, save. You watch Futurama? And there's a Futurama where there's a box with the universe in it. And then Hermes decides he's going to throw it into the sun. And they get there just in time and say, don't throw that universe into the sun. And there's a, and he did what I did. He had a button. He's like, okay. <laughs> all right. He decided not to kill them all. Yeah. Yeah, the truth hurts. Okay, so now I do 2-6-18-1 hike. Is that right? Yeah. It is. Right. Football season's over. Yeah, that was a good game. That was a good game. Would you like to play it? Absolutely not. Yeah. All right. And as Dave Chappelle said, you're done. Oh. He didn't say class dismissed. No. He didn't say that. <laughs> Man, why is this?